Hello, I'm Bill Morrison from Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. I'm going to be speaking about osteomyelitis acute and chronic. The first thing you need to know is that infection has different modes of spread around the body. Hematogenous is the most common and is seen in spine infections, septic arthritis, and other conditions. Contiguous spread is seen especially in paralyzed patients in the pelvis through decubitus ulceration and in diabetic patients at the foot and ankle. Direct implantation can also occur, and this is especially common with penetrating injuries and puncture wounds in the foot and hand, but also in postoperative situations. As I mentioned, hematogenous spread is the most common. We see this in cases of septic arthritis, osteomyelitis around the body, especially spine, including discitis. But the disc is not primarily involved usually by infection. Usually the infection deposits in the capillaries, and the end arterioles in the spine are at the margins of the end plates. Now the disc is avascular normally, but the disc material is very tasty to bacteria. So the bacteria jump from the end plate into the disc and eat it up and then rapidly cross over to the other side, giving the classic appearance of discitis and osteomyelitis. Now, that's an arterial method of transmission. You can also get venous transmission to the spine, and that's usually related to Batson's plexus. And this is a common source of implantation, especially in patients with pelvic infections and tuberculous infections of the genitourinary system. Batson's plexus is a valveless drainage system of the pelvis and spine, and pelvic infections can transmit up to the spine through this venous plexus. Now, hematogenous infection uh, can also be deposited in the joint, leading to septic arthritis. The early MR features include joint effusion, synovitis with complex fluid, and erosions at the edges or bare areas that are unprotected by a cartilaginous surface. If you give contrast, you'll see thick rim enhancement. Now, the important thing to know at this stage is that this can look a lot like any other inflammatory arthropathy, including gout, rheumatoid arthritis, or other conditions. But it's very important if there's an unexplained joint effusion to always consider the possibility of septic arthritis. Now, as the septic arthritis becomes more established, you develop massive hyperemia. And this is shown in this image of the knee with overflow of the blood vessels leading to this perivascular edema pattern in the bone marrow. This is analogous to a heavy rainstorm with overflowing of a river that can't accommodate the water anymore. If the infection is allowed to progress, it eventually extends into the subchondral bone and the medullary space, and you'll see replacement of T1 signal, you'll see bone marrow edema on fluid sequences, and contrast enhancement. At this stage, it's progressed to osteomyelitis. Contrast can be very useful to distinguish other etiologies from septic arthritis. In this case, at the elbow, we have thick rim enhancement of the synovium, and we have extension of infection into the humerus and the radius. An important point uh, is that in small joints, infection spreads rapidly outside of the joint. The small joints, like in the fingers, cannot accommodate a large effusion, and infection results in a rapidly enlarging joint effusion. So early on in these small joints, the infection bursts out from the capsule and leads to periarticular edema infection and infection of adjacent structures. In this case on MRI, you can see the septic arthritis in the finger has burst out of the capsule and is involving the surrounding soft tissues and tendon sheaths. The sternoclavicular joint and the acromioclavicular joint are two small joints as well, and infection of these joints bursts out of the capsule early on, extending superiorly up the sternocleidomastoid and into the retrosternal space and pectoralis major musculatures. Another classic small joint that undergoes septic arthritis is the sacroiliac joint. Now, this is another very small joint, and infection in the joint bursts out of the capsule and extends usually into the sciatic notch, but also into the gluteus musculature. Now, the sciatic notch is where the sciatic nerve lives, obviously, and patients experience pain extending down the leg. Now, this is often misinterpreted by referring clinicians as a disc herniation 
in the spine. And oftentimes you'll get a spine MRI to evaluate this type of patient. So as a radiologist, it's important to recognize this and to look at the lower aspect of the images and to see if there's any inflammation of the sacroiliac joint that could represent infection. Here's another example of hematogenous spread, this time into the bone, not into the joint. So this is hematogenous osteomyelitis of the calcaneus. Now, this can look like a lot of other things. We considered also the possibility of tumor like lymphoma. But in this case, uh, because of the fluid in the center, we considered abscess, and this turned out to be an infection. Now, this shows very well how the joint can actually be a mode of spread for infection uh, in addition. In this case, two weeks later, despite debridement, the infection spread into the subtalar joint, which often communicates with the ankle joint, as in this case. Now, notice this little osteochondral lesion at the plafond. That's a cartilage defect, and that was a mode of transmission from the joint into the subchondral bone and medullary space. So it's very important to evaluate patients for transmission of infection and potential for transmission of infection from one compartment to another. In children, infection has a very uh, interesting mode of spread that varies depending on the age of the uh, pediatric patient. In infancy, blood vessels and arterioles extend all the way to the epiphysis, and hematogenous spread of infection typically presents as septic arthritis in those young patients. In children, the epiphysis and metaphysis have separate end arterioles, and the infection tends to get deposited into the metaphysis, leading to the classic Brody's abscess. In adulthood, vessels are reestablished to the epiphysis from the uh, shaft of the bone, leading to a uh, variety of uh, areas that the infection can be deposited. But here's a classic Brody's abscess in a child, uh, going all the way up to the physeal plate, with a classic pattern of fluid signal surrounding edema, and in this case, periosteal reaction. Very often, Brody's abscess has a appearance which drips to the physeal plate. So here is the lesion in the metaphysis, and here is this dripping appearance extending to the physeal plate, and that is very specific for Brody's abscess. Now, these abscesses can become uh, more chronic, and when they become more chronic, they become less uh, inflammatory, the body walls off the infection, and it leads to this appearance of fluid signal inside the bone, usually at the metaphysis. If you give contrast, you'll see thick rim enhancement again. In this situation, if there's no clinical history provided, this could look like a tumor, but you have to consider the possibility of an interosseous abscess, especially in the susceptible population. Now, if you allow the infection to progress longer, which fortunately we don't see much anymore, you get the classic textbook pattern of chronic osteomyelitis. The bone becomes devitalized um, with no blood flow left, leading to lack of enhancement on these post-contrast images. This devitalized bone is called a sequestrum. The new bone formation around the sequestrum is called the involucrum. And this is vascularized new bone formation. And you'll see the inflammation around the sequestrum, which eventually leads to sinus tract formation extending to the skin as a cloaca. Now, direct implantation can also occur, especially in the hands and feet, open fractures in the fingers, punch to the mouth with inoculation of the tendon sheets, puncture wounds of the lower extremity, and also after surgery or other interventions. And here's an example of direct implantation a uh, young patient stepped on a nail, and here is the tract of the nail extending into the calcaneus. Here's a patient who developed an abscess after stepping on a nail many, many years ago. And these infections can get walled off, as I mentioned, and become chronic and indolent, reoccurring periodically um, as the body's defenses are, are challenged. Now, infection can also be deposited at surgery, and this is a patient who had an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Now, although the surgeon put these screws into the bone, generally after surgery, there's not much edema in the bone marrow. Uh, even after reaming uh, for rods, even after total replacement of the joint. So any edema in the marrow after surgery 
especially in a patient who is presenting with symptoms of infection or signs of infection, should be considered highly suspicious for deposition of uh, infection into the postoperative area. Contiguous spread can also occur. We see this through ulcerations of various sorts, especially in diabetic patients and in paralyzed patients. Here's a patient with septic olecranon bursitis with fluid in the olecranon bursa at the elbow and surrounding inflammation. Now notice there's no involvement of the olecranon. However, this can become more indolent, ulcerate, and involve the olecranon itself. In this case, septic olecranon bursitis, ulceration, and involvement of the olecranon. Paralyzed patients acquire decubitus ulceration, which can lead to chronic osteomyelitis as well. And here we see a patient with a decubitus ulcer under the greater trochanter. And although the ulcer goes almost all the way to bone, on MRI, post-contrast images show there's no involvement of the marrow cavity. And these can occur uh, over the sacrum. They can occur over the posterior iliac bone. In this patient with uh, paralysis, they developed greater trochanteric bursitis bilaterally. And the question was whether or not they have infection. Here you see the ulceration extending to the greater trochanteric bursa on the right. On the left, it's not pictured. Here the fluid sequence shows extension of infection all the way up the gluteus musculature on the right side, and we have a suspicious joint effusion. We also have bone marrow edema within the greater trochanters bilaterally, and through contiguity, we are suspicious that that represents osteomyelitis. Post-contrast images are very useful because they not only show thick rim enhancement of the greater trochanteric bursa, but also enhancement of the synovium of the right hip joint, suspicious for contiguous spread into the joint itself. Now, these patients will eventually undergo chronic osteomyelitis. And chronic osteomyelitis is a uh, repair process with persistent infection that leads to sclerosis. And here the ischium is diffusely sclerotic. This can be very hard to differentiate from osteomyelitis in many situations. However, MRI, especially fluid-sensitive sequences like STIR sequences, if you see edema or enhancement in the area of sclerosis, generally you're dealing with an active infection. Contiguous spread can occur from the skin as well from other situations besides ulceration. And this is a patient with group B streptococcus infection, the classic flesh-eating bacteria that ate through the skin, the soft tissues, and into the bone. The most common manifestation of contiguous spread that we see in our population is in diabetic patients through ulcerations of the foot. And these can occur in different locations based on uh, uh, footwear and other conditions. We typically see these in pressure points over the first and fifth metatarsal heads, over the calcaneus, especially in bedridden patients, and over the malleoli. You also see them in areas of deformity. If patients have collapse of the arch, you'll see it under the cuboid. And if patients have claw toe deformities, you'll see them over the dorsum of the toes, especially if they have ill-fitting footwear. It's very important to diagnose the spread of infection in these patients because infection can spread far away from the initial ulceration. Here, a patient with a ulcer at the medial uh, aspect of the forefoot, an infection spread proximally and uh, dorsally to the extensor compartment. Here in a different patient on the right, we see a shallow ulceration over the calcaneus, osteomyelitis of the posterior tubercle, but it's important to note that there's infection also extending up the Achilles tendon. It's also important to diagnose the extent of osseous infection. This is important for preoperative evaluation to determine limb-sparing partial amputations. In this case, you can easily delineate the margins of the infection and help the surgeon plan their procedure. Devitalization is also important to identify. These cause regional areas of non-enhancement similar to infarctions of other organs. These can only be seen after contrast administration. But these are important to identify because antibiotics will not get to these areas. So the surgeons generally will need to either revascularize the tissue uh, or through a vascular procedure, 
or they need to debride the uh, area of necrosis. Here's another example with devitalization at the great toe. Here we see a region of non-enhancement, and you'll see generally at the margins of the necrotic area a region of hyperemia with increased enhancement that helps delineate the area of necrosis. And again, this is important for the surgeon to know about in order to either revascularize the patient or debride that tissue. Here's a patient with an abscess at the pelvis, and it's easy to see the abscess in the iliopsoas, um, but it's harder to see the area of necrosis unless you give contrast. Here on the right, T1 post contrast shows non enhancement involving the iliac bone. So, again, this is an area that uh, will need to be debrided or revascularized. There are other situations where you can get infarcted tissue, and this is an example of a patient with sickle cell. Here we see the infarction sharply defined with fat signal in the center. And here we have an area of uh, edema, massive periosteal reaction, and actually disruption of the anterior cortex of the tibia, or what we call a cloaca. And we biopsied through that area, and this ended up being infected bone with underlying infarction. Early osteomyelitis is another important concept. You know, we've been taught that the T1 marrow signal is replaced in the setting of osteomyelitis, but that's not true necessarily in early infections. The fat takes time to metabolize inside the bone. So if you catch an infection very early on, the fat signal may not be completely replaced yet. So we see an area of edema at the hind foot and midfoot. We see enhancement, but the T1 signal is not completely replaced. Now, this patient was not a surgical candidate. They were treated medically and followed up three weeks later. Now we're starting to get replacement of the T1 signal completely, and this is more compatible with osteomyelitis. Now, the patient still was followed, and four days later, you can see now classic osteomyelitis with involvement of the midfoot and hindfoot. Chronic osteomyelitis, as I mentioned, is also difficult to diagnose. As I mentioned, sclerosis occurs, but you look on the fluid-sensitive sequences like STIR uh, or post-contrast images, and if you see areas of edema or enhancement, those may indicate a um, more active site of infection. So those are the areas to target if you're going to do biopsy. In this example, we see a patient with uh, chronic osteomyelitis after trauma, and here we have a non-enhancing focus in the center, uh, and that represents a sequestrum. And here is the sinus tract extending out to the skin. So to summarize, remember the modes of spread that affect different locations of the body and look for regional extension. Consider the appearance of acute infection and chronic infection, which have different appearances, and consider comorbidities such as diabetes and paralysis. And thank you very much for your time.